<laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for having me. And thank you for having me back when I stood you all up last time at the uh, annual meeting. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a, a bit about why that was um, when, I, when I come to it in the presentation. But here's um, the time when I first remember being really interested in botany. And that was, uh, well, I was six at the time, there's me, with my dad. And you can probably tell we're, the, we're at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. Um, and uh, you can tell that he's a relatively recent immigrant to the country because he's wearing a suit to go to uh, Botan Botanic Gardens on a Saturday afternoon because obviously it's royal and therefore you have to wear a suit. Um, uh, but one of the ways that he and my mum uh, kind of uh, sort of jollied us along and got us interested in plants was by um, telling us stories about them. And the way that he would instigate those stories would be by feeding us bits of them. Now, I don't know, you probably recognize this one. This is Diffenbachia. And if you buy it, um, it comes with a public health warning saying, do not give to children or animals. But I remember my father giving me a little uh, taste of a corner of that leaf. I don't know if you've ever tried it. Uh, it's not very nice. In fact, the raphids, the uh, little sort of uh, pointy crystals inside the cells, um, uh, accelerate the poison in this plant into your throat and, and tongue and stop you talking for a while. Uh, and my dad didn't do this as a sort of punishment for me, nor did he do it uh, out of fun. Uh, he did it because he wanted to tell me a rather important story, which is a story about slavery, actually, because this plant in the United States is called dumb canes and was given as a as a sort of punishment uh, to enslaved people. And at the age of I think I was probably 10 or so, uh, he wanted to tell me that that story. And that's how he broached it. Um, uh, another one that I had uh, probably when I was seven or eight was a lick of one of these, which you also probably recognize. This is a, an opium poppy. And uh, the effect on my tongue was actually not terribly great. Uh, it just made it, as I remember, go slightly like as if I'd put a sort of a bit of an ice cube or something for a moment on my tongue. But um, the effect on my teacher was much more exciting. And uh, she uh, obviously reported the matter to the social services and they sent someone around to talk to my parents. <laughs> Um, but that was my sort of introduction to uh, to botany. And then later in life, I was uh, lucky enough to be a documentary filmmaker and managed to travel a lot. And one of the things that I, uh, uh, I noticed as I was traveling were the plants. I wasn't actually making documentaries about plants, but I, I noticed the plants and the incredible diversity. And I, uh, when I sort of joined the board of Q, um, mostly as, a, as an expert in, in sort of public understanding of science and of technology, which is what they needed at the time. I uh, had the chance to go on sort of expeditions and things as a filmmaker. And the more plants I saw, the more I just thought, this is just crazy. Just the, the sheer ridiculous kind of variety. And all of these have obviously evolved, uh, as you all know, to fill different environmental niches. Um, there's, uh, uh, I think that's woody nightshade probably in the middle there, and uh, um, I'll come back to the feisty solanums later on. But sadly, about 40% or two out of every five plants are at risk of extinction, mostly because of, of us, of human beings. Obviously not us, the Wildflower Society, we do the opposite. Um, and uh, I, I remember once I was in the Andes on a seed collecting expedition, and uh, uh, something made me think about uh, something called plant blindness. And I, I was looking at this hummingbird, uh, which is the, the species that is the sort of largest hummingbird in the world. And I, I was absolutely captivated by it. And I called over very quietly one of the botanists, the real botanists who's with me, and uh, said, look, look, isn't that amazing? Isn't that absolutely fantastic? And he said, yeah, it is amazing. It'll be great when the bird gets out of the way and I can see it properly. Because, of course, he was looking at the world uh, as if he uh, was, uh, was looking only at plants and uh, pity the poor me uh, thinking about uh, an animal. Uh, so he had sort of animal blindness. I had plant blindness. And it did make me think that a lot of people just sort of forget about plants, but they live their lives rooted to the spot, literally. Uh, and able to do these uh, sort of amazing things. Um, they have to feed, defend and reproduce, uh, all while not sort of moving anywhere, or not moving anywhere very fast. 
And uh, one of the things that I uh, realized as I was making documentaries was just how many misconceptions people have about plants. So my talk today is really about um, the, the sort of, you know, some of the misconceptions that people have. And I suspect that a lot of people in this audience will know a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about, but perhaps uh, the way that I talk about them might help you when you're communicating to other people, I don't know. And uh, those travels, including this one to Madagascar, um, is what, uh, you know, decades later caused me to uh, cancel our last uh, appointment with each other because, uh, you know, the various tropical diseases I had then um, uh, are not with me now, but they do cause me to be uh, a bit more sensitive to things than I would otherwise be. So I apologize for that. So when I was at Bristol University um, as, as a sort of visiting uh, professor there, I uh, ran a seminar every year with science graduates uh, who were about to embark on becoming teacher, teacher training. Um, so they'd all got science degrees. And I asked them this question, a little seed weighs next to nothing, um, and a tree obviously weighs a lot, and the charcoal that you could make from a tree uh, weighs a lot. So where did all the stuff come from? Where did all the, the mass, the weight of this come from? And the answers they give, 85% um, of people every year, science graduates, said that mass comes out of the ground, right? So the mass of this dry carbon <laughs> comes out of the ground, according to them. And uh, about 5% of people would say that it comes from sunlight somehow, the weight comes from sunlight. And uh, only the, you know, about 15 or 20% of people would say, uh, or, or about 10 or 15% of people would say, actually, it comes out of the air. And that is the answer, that the, all of the weight of that carbon, uh, all of the uh, charcoal came out of the air. And that uh, as carbon dioxide as the, the one of the two main ingredients, along with water, for photosynthesis. So you all know this, but the people you speak to will not know that. And even though they realize that uh, when you look at a pot plant, you're not constantly having to top up the, uh, the soil as the plant grows, a couple of drops of baby bio will just about do it, and some water. Um, even though they, they can observe that, and they know that we don't have lorries going around filling in all the soil that, people have that the trees have taken out, they still believe that the stuff comes out of the ground. So it's just a, a useful thing if you're, if you're chatting to people, perhaps, that uh, you might want to know that they have that misconception. And if you need any more convincing, here's Spanish moss or Tillandsia. Now, it's not actually a moss and it's not actually Spanish, but it's a cousin of the pineapple and it grows hanging on trees in the American Deep South. And it's very much look, uh, uh, the sort of look and feel of uh, Gone with the Wind which is appropriate really, because um, uh, this uh, plant gets what it needs from rain and air. It doesn't have roots that go into the tree. The extra nutrients it needs might come from dust in the air and maybe the odd bird dropping. Um, it's uh, an epiphyte and it's odd curly stuff. It used to be used for stuffing mattresses and the seats of early motor cars. It looks actually like uh, they've got a bit carried away there. Um, and as you can see, it grows even on electricity wires in midair, no soil required. Um, let me uh, just read you uh, a little bit about Spanish moss from uh, um, around the world native plants, in fact. An eerily iconic plant of the swampy southern states, it has skeletal finger-length leaves that curl together into chains, forming elongated grey-green curtains that drape from trees and telephone wires. Victorian travellers to the deep south wrote melodramatically of trees that swept the cobwebs from the sky or appeared to them as witches weeping in the moonlight. It is indeed a strange plant. Spanish moss is also used to stuff hoodoo dolls, charms believed to ward off evil and bring good fortune to oneself, or more rarely misfortune to another. Hoodoo is a spiritual offshoot of Louisiana voodoo, a system of beliefs that developed in the southern states from the traditions of the West African diaspora transported there in the 18th century. The link with hoodoo talismans contributes to the plant's creepy reputation. But the people who craft those dolls may be playing on more primitive emotions. Perhaps Spanish moss and the swamps it inhabits embody nature untamed, rampant, and beyond our control. 
And perhaps when you're uh, talking to people, um, you know, the, the people who want all those tidy gardens, uh, uh, you know, there's something about taming nature, which maybe some, some of us who love wildflowers um, are less keen on. And now water carries the chemicals around the plant and keeps tissues kind of turgid and rigid. Uh, but along with carbon dioxide, it's one of the two vital ingredients in photosynthesis. And plants will do anything to get water. Most striking, of course, when water is short. So uh, in deserts, for example, these dragon trees in Socotra, uh, which is just off the coast of Yemen, funnel every little droplet of rain or dew down to the center. And cacti, um, they protect their precious water by a special kind of metabolism where they manage to keep their pores closed during the day, um, absorb carbon dioxide at night, store it in a kind of solid form, uh, and then um, use daylight uh, the next day to, um, uh, to perform photosynthesis, to uh, having released the carbon dioxide. Very clever. Um, and that way they don't have to open the tiny pores in their leaves during the day, risking losing water, water vapor. And look at the aloe vera plant, um, uh, the, the one uh, you know, that's um, used in cosmetics and so on. Very, very tough armored leaves, um, and, and it's got this sort of uh, watery gel inside. But in between the two, there's a layer of a kind of a yellowish layer, uh, very, very, very bitter. Um, it's the stuff that they used to put on children's fingernails and pencil tops to stop them biting. Uh, I think my brother suffered from that. <laughs> I think it had stopped by the time that, uh, uh, that, that I came on the scene. Um, and this is Mujar. Um, this is Western Australian Christmas tree. Uh, look how it's absolutely bursting with life. Uh, and it's bursting with life even in this rather dry, uh, arid environment. And its reason for being able to do that is that it has a dirty little secret. Uh, it's a parasite. In fact, it's a hemiparasite. Um, it draws water and other trace nutrients, but mainly water, from other plants. And this is a member of the mistletoe family. Uh, so it's actually very similar to, um, to our mistletoes biologically. Uh, it sends out its roots, uh, this one, over very long distances, perhaps 80 meters or more. And it attaches this collar around the root. Um, and it kind of uh, has these hydraulic secateurs that snip, <laughs> snip the root and then it plugs itself in. Uh, which uh, is, is rather cool. And the way that the Mujar, uh, the way that the Mujar root sniffs out its target is by following a sort of molecular hormone trail through the soil. And some of those same chemicals are present in some plastics. And those plastics are used for insulating some electrical cables. So you can see where I'm going with this. For that reason, the beautiful Mujar has been known to attack and sever telephone wires. And there's something about this that I find incredibly pleasing. Uh, it's like the plant world getting its own back uh, on, uh, on technology. Um, if water is one half of the photosynthesis equation, the other half carbon dioxide, and of course, a fabulous variety of leaf shapes and sizes and patterns all evolved to fill a niche, all evolved to absorb carbon dioxide, uh, and the chemical factories are right in there uh, creating sugars. Uh, absolutely fantastic uh, variety. And one of my favorite leaves is the giant water lily, uh, Victoria Amazonica, named after Queen Victoria, of course. And I love the way it's evolved with spouts. Um, uh, perhaps you can see one there, so it doesn't get waterlogged. Um, and the system of uh, load-bearing struts was the inspiration for the Crystal Palace, the great exhibition in 1851. St Paul's Cathedral, that is. Um, and uh, these um, uh, leaves enable the plant efficiently to use the water surface, uh, but also serve another very important purpose, and that is to uh, support one of the great photo cliches of our age, the, the baby on the leaf. I, I think they've cheated there. <laughs> they've put something to spread the load even further, but there you are. You can support a baby on, a, on one of those leaves. Another of my favorites with all sorts of strong links to water is the lotus. Um, if, if you have your roots in South or Southeast Asia, you'll be going gooey eyed now. This is uh, like sort of uh, the, the chicken soup of, uh, of, of South and Southeast Asia, uh, the soul food. 
the um, it's a fabulous flower. Um, just about all parts of the plant are actually edible, and, and not only edible, they're actually quite good. It grows in water, um, uh, often quite polluted water, and the the seed head uh, looks uh, very much like a shower head to me. Uh, and there's an incredible sort of underwater breathing system for the roots. Uh, what I particularly like about the lotus is the way that it cleans its leaves. Um, so uh, it's uh, got these very, very tiny um, uh, sort of uh, dimpled structure on it, which uh, stops the water droplet from spreading out. It means that the, uh, the sort of molecular cohesion of the water enables it to form a droplet just in the way that, um, you know, on, on a really good anorak, uh, you get the sort of droplets forming. Uh, the water can't spread out. Now, this is called the um, uh, lotus effect, and it stops the water wetting the surface. And the effect is that as the leaf kind of wobbles around in the in the breeze, um, it's, uh, it sort of picks up any dust and detritus and so on. And uh, and then when when the water sort of uh, you know slushes off, it carries all those sort of fungal spores and and dust and so on with it, meaning that the leaf can carry on photosynthesizing efficiency efficiently. But of course, when we look at this, um, this this is really jewel like, and uh, South and Southeast Asian religions have have picked up on that. So in Hinduism, um, the goddess uh, Lakshmi. Uh, is depicted couched on a lotus flower, um, also uh, sort of holding a, a lotus blossom in her hand, denoting purity, uh, sort of wealth and fertility and purity go, going hand in hand. And uh, in, uh, well, let me read you uh, a little bit about, um, sorry, just find the page. Um, in, in Buddhism, uh, very embarrassing that I've lost the page of my own book. <laughs> Here we go, sorry. In Buddhism, by tradition, lotus plants sprouted in the first footsteps of Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, and the common mantra among Tibetan Buddhists, Om Mani Padme Hum, draws together the lotus with enlightenment and inestimable worth in one hypnotically repeated Sanskrit phrase. The lotus, perfect and unsullied by the muddy waters in which it grows, with glittering beads of water that dance and sparkle jewel-like in the centre of its leaves, symbolises the spiritual journey towards light and wisdom. Now, before we leave the subject of photosynthesis, let me put in a word for a couple of really important photosynthesizers. Um, now, you might not think of these as plants. Uh, these are uh, phytoplankton. Um, but, uh, and this is another one of um, Lucille Clerc's gorgeous illustrations from the, from the book. Uh, she's a, a French artist who lives in London. Um, but, uh, um, well, let me, let me read you. Microscopic single-celled organisms may not fit everyone's definition of a plant, but a plant's most important capability is to photosynthesize, and phytoplankton certainly do that. Most of them live for just a few days drifting on ocean currents, suspended near the surface where there's light. Using sunshine to power the process, phytoplankton consume carbon dioxide dissolved in seawater and incorporate carbon compounds into their tiny bodies, just as carbon is stored by the wood and leaves of a tree. They may be small, but they're abundant. A tablespoon of seawater may contain hundreds of thousands of individuals. Together, the world's marine phytoplankton absorb as much carbon dioxide and give off as much oxygen as all the trees and every other land plant combined. They're also the ocean's primary producers, the first link in the food chain. Without them, hardly any other sea life would be possible. Phytoplankton are typically the width of a fine hair, but can be much smaller. Magnification reveals a parallel universe of intricate structures, the stuff of acid dreams, solitary spaceships and implausibly geometric shapes, minute snakes and ladders, and garlands of elaborate beads on infinitesimal threads. There are thousands of different species. I love the feeling of something uh, sort of hidden in plain sight like that. Now here's a plant that, of course, <laughs> everyone in this audience knows extremely well, uh, Equisetum, mare's tail or horse tail. Very abrasive, the silicates uh, sand effectively, uh, protect the plant from herbivores, but uh, have also been used for 
uh, polishing furniture and clarinet reeds and so on. Um, and uh, it's a very primitive plant, uh, so primitive that 360 million years ago, its big brother, big brothers, Calamites, um, which I always think of calamities, but anyway, Calamites uh, were massive trees, 50 meters high or so, and uh, they were the main sort of plants really on the on the uh, on the planet. And uh, the the thing is that these massive things, 160 feet high, um, they didn't rot. Now. Uh, some of them didn't rot uh, because, uh, you know, of the explanation we were given at school, which is they fell into a swamp and it was anaerobic and, um, you know, just like bog oak in, in Ireland uh, and things preserved in peat, uh, they didn't rot and eventually they uh, enough accreted so they got squished. Um, that's never been entirely satisfactory to me because I've always thought that, um, uh, you know, stuff kind of floats and doesn't get completely squished and, and so on. And uh, there is scientific debate about this, but uh, it seems that there were uh, a lot of this is because 360 million years ago, um, bacteria and fungi hadn't quite evolved yet to efficiently break down lignin, uh, the woody stuff in, 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 uh, in trees. And they took another 60 million years ago, to, million years uh, to get really good at that. Um, and that period, 360 to 300 million years ago, uh, was the Carboniferous period. And as the name suggests, that's when the world's coal um, was, was laid down. And of course, you know, the thought of releasing 60 millions, million years worth of, uh, of sunshine, uh, sun, sorry, of um, carbon dioxide, um, uh, you know, that has been uh, put there by the power of sunshine, uh, the, the thought of releasing all that carbon dioxide in just a few tens or hundreds of years is absolute madness. So nowadays, dead wood does rot, and when it does, carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. Um, so building lots of wooden frame buildings is obviously a very, very good idea, as is buying lots of books <laughs> and uh, uh, keeping them on your shelves, wooden shelves because uh, uh, is a good place to put carbon dioxide. So we've talked about photosynthesis um, and uh, you know the main ingredients being uh, obviously carbon dioxide water, uh, but it's all very well photosynthesizing, but not much good if something eats you before you've had the time to live and reproduce. And so the next section of what I want to talk about is defense and in particular the sort of uh, our relationships with, uh, with the ways plant def plants defend themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, there are lots of strategies for this. There are things that are very, very sharp <laughs> uh, and stop things eating you, uh, as in uh, this pachypodium from Madagascar. Uh, you can put chemicals in your bark, uh, like tannin, uh, that sort of um, mess with the digestive systems of herbivores. Uh, you can signal to other trees if you're under attack, so that they make um, uh, defense chemicals, and these oak trees certainly do that if they're attacked. Um, uh, and uh, some of those chemicals waft through the air and trigger other trees to make those chemicals, which they don't want to have on standby all the time because they're rather sort of biologically expensive to produce. And some of those signals are actually sent through the fungal networks underneath uh, in the forest that we've heard so much about. Um, so there's ways that plants communicate with each other, or at least information is sent um, in order to, uh, uh, sorry, information is sent that triggers um, uh, other plants to, to to create, you know, defense chemicals of their own. Um, I'm, I'm not putting intentionality on there. Uh, I'm, I'm steering clear of that. Uh, then you've got um, uh, this, for example, cherry laurel. Um, the military have taken a tip from this plant where you take two uh, fairly innocuous, easy to store chemicals, but when they're chomped, when they uh, something bites them or mixes them together, then that makes cyanide. Uh, the mansion eel, every part of that plant is just ghastly and says stay away. Um, th this one, you've probably had some of this today. Um, this is caffeine. Uh, this is uh, coffee, uh, uh, which contains caffeine. And the purpose of the caffeine for the plant is partly to dissuade insects. Um, if we've got time, we could talk about why there's actually some caffeine uh, in nectar. Um, but uh, partly, 
uh, it's partly that, but mostly actually to discourage other plants from competing. And if you've ever tried growing tomatoes underneath your walnut tree, um, uh, that's, uh, we think, some, something to do with uh, the same sort of allelopathic kind of behaviours. And coffee is another one which um, is very difficult to grow, um, uh, you know, grow things underneath um, uh, a coffee plant. And this one, you might have thought, well, I've included this to show that this is some sort of poisonous sap that is dissuading the insect that's just been eating this. But actually, um, this exudation contains pheromones that attract the thing that has come to eat the plant. So that's a very nice way of defending yourself is that you, you don't create a poison, you just create something that attracts something that will eat the thing that is attacking you. It's very nice. So here's a very well defended plant, uh, possibly familiar to you is the prickly pear or opuntia. Um, you might know it as the sabra, you might associate it with the Middle East, um, but it's actually native to Mexico. And to the Aztecs, it was Tionochtli, the goddess of the sun. It's got these beautiful yellow flowers, so you can see why they called it that. And it's a very interesting plant. What looks like leaves are actually, um, uh, those pads are actually the stems of the plant and the thorns uh, effectively, especially adapted leaves. Now the fruit are edible, you might have had them before, you have to take the spines off, uh, but can we just admit that they're a bit disappointing? <laughs> um, in Mexico, the pads are the popular thing, uh, and you take the spines off and, and uh, fry these up, and they're, they're called nopal, um, and they're, they're much more interesting. Um, but this is a plant that is culturally so important that the Mexican flag, I don't know if you can see it, but right there in the middle of the Mexican flag, along with this, um, I'm not quite sure what bird that is, but um, along with everything else, right in the middle is the prickly pear. Uh, now, why is it? Why is it that it's so important to the Mexicans? And the reason is that the Aztecs cultivated this plant um, as a source of red dye, and it is indeed still cultivated for that purpose. Now, the dye doesn't come from the plant itself, but from a little insect that lives on it, cochineal beetle. And the Aztecs had bred and bred these little beetles and farmed them, domesticated them um, on the pads of prickly pears. And they'd been doing that for um, probably a thousand years before the Spanish arrived. And that method that they developed is still, this, this is uh, the, Sp the Spanish reports on that method. You can see the, the sort of, um, uh, you know, gardens where they grew these and, the, you know, there they are scraping the bits off and so on. Uh, the method is still used today. Now, the insects produce this sort of white waxy coating um, uh, to protect themselves probably from ultraviolet light. Um, but underneath, they're bright red. And uh, I'm afraid uh, you have to uh, kill them in, in uh, boiling water and then um, uh, and then you extract the dye and you need gazillions of little insects to make uh, cochineal dye. Um, and there, there's a modern plantation. So in the 1500s, the Spanish were absolutely stunned by these fabrics that they saw in, in bright, colour-fast scarlet. And after silver and gold, cochineal became the most valuable export from Mexico. It was used by royalty back in Spain. Um, Spain managed to protect the secret of the source for about 200 years, so, uh, for, you know, uh, right up until 1700 and something. But eventually everyone got in on it and um, uh, was dyed with cochineal. Oliver Cromwell chose cochineal for the dye for soldiers' uniforms. And that meant that um, uh, everyone wanted it. And uh, because the secret was out, they all the Europeans decided to plant this thing, which didn't grow very well, the Apuntia, the prickly pear, decided to uh, plant it all over the world in their colonies. Now, um, the, in 1788, the governor of New South Wales decided this would be a most fantastic thing to have. Um, bring in the prickly pear, bring in the little insects, um, and what could possibly go wrong? Uh, so the governor of New South Wales uh, you know, said yes, and uh, what happened was that these finicky little insects, which were bred over centuries uh, in Mexico, failed to thrive in Australia. So the Aztecs hadn't counted on people wanting to export this stuff to Australia. 
And with nothing to eat it, the cactus spread like wildfire. And uh, this is the newspaper cutting from um, 1912. Um, uh, 29 million acres, it says, um, has have been captured by this plant. Um, by 1925, 100,000 square miles, 100,000 square miles, can you imagine it, of valuable grazing land were covered in Opuntia, in prickly pear. And people tried slashing it, burning it. Thousands of tons of ghastly arsenic compounds were dumped on it, uh, which still have an effect today. Nothing worked. Eventually, in the most important biocontrol project ever, three billion eggs of a Mexican moth, which was encouragingly called Cactoblastis cactorum, were introduced. Now they'd evolved in Mexico to dine out on prickly pear and largely solve the problem. Except of course, those moths have now been spread around the world and are attacking cacti elsewhere. But if you go to uh, Australia, here's in Queensland, you can't quite read it, there, but it, it says the Cactoblastis Memorial Hall. Uh, people are very grateful to the Cactoblastis. And Campari, um, the drink um, uh, developed in 1860 by Gaspar Campari, uh, that contained cochineal. In the United States and Europe, it doesn't contain cochineal anymore, but in some parts of the world, Campari, if you order a drink, does contain cochineal. And if your uh, lipstick says carmine on it, then that will have come from cochineal insects. Um, and uh, it's being used more and more actually as people are more and more concerned about uh, sort of uh, artificial chemical additives. I like that story. Um, let's talk about dandelions. Uh, so obviously the seeds carry a long way on their little tiny halos of spinning air, um, like a sort of horizontal smoke ring, but without, of course. Um, and uh, many plants uh, have latex to gum up insects and sort of seal wounds and sometimes even poison insects. And rubber is the most well known of those. But who knew about dandelion rubber? So if you take a dandelion root and snap it, you'll get the, the latex. Um, but some dandelions have uh, much more of the kind of rubbery latex in their roots. Um, and in particular, uh, the Russian dandelion, um, uh, the, it's the, the coxagis um, uh, species. And they um, have enough in them that it was worth during the war when dis, uh, supplies of rubber from the Far East were disrupted. Um, people started experimenting with planting lots of, um, uh, of, of dandelions. Uh, that picture on, on your left is uh, some, uh, some women planting dandelions in the United States. Uh, this is a modern dandelion field in Czechoslovakia. And uh, it, this, this dandelion experiment has been resurrected recently because uh, even though the uh, rubber supplies came back after the war, uh, now people are more worried about you know, destroying rainforest to plant rubber plantations. And uh, so people have looked again for other sources and have been breeding um, the Russian dandelion to give us more and more of this latex. And I'm pleased to say that the first dandelion rubber tires have actually been released onto the market. They're not really um, sold as dandelion rubber tires because people, you know, the marketing people probably think that that won't be popular. Uh, but uh, Continental have at least one and there's a, a big project from the European Union um, to develop dandelion tires. There you go. And that's all down to a defence mechanism uh, for, the, uh, for the plant, uh, which we've made good use of. Um, here's, here's a plant with an interesting set of defences. This is the castor bean or castor oil plant, originated in the Horn of Africa, uh, Ricinus communis, um, uh, brought to Italy by the Romans, popular in civic gardens. Each prickly capsule uh, has three shiny seeds, uh, intricate pattern probably for camouflage from rodents. And the seeds have this ra rather lovely relationship with ants. The eliasome, if you can just see it, the sort of little bit on the end of the seed, um, rich in fat and protein. The ants feed the nourishing bits to their larvae and then jettison the rest. Uh, so the rest is still viable um, and they pop it onto the refuse pile, which is very full of fertilizer. Uh, and that's good for the plants and good for, and the, and the ants get a good deal as well. And that, that uh, system of ant distribution or ant dispersal is called myrmecockery, which is one of my favorite words, myrmecockery. Um, it's a euphorbia. Uh, and euphorbias, as you know, are pretty, you know, feisty. Um, 
And castor seeds contain ricin, which is a deadly poison, just a thousandth of a gram or so can kill. Um, in fact, Georgi Markov, um, a, uh, a Russian, uh, uh, sorry, a, a Bulgarian dissident in, uh, in London was killed in the 1990s by uh, uh, a Russian agent with a, a poisoned umbrella. Uh, a, a capsule the size of a pinhead was injected into his leg and the uh, ricin leaked out um, uh, and, and killed him. Uh, but when the, uh, the oil is heat treated, um, there is none of the ricin, uh, the, the poison in it. And right, uh, you know, this, this is something that has been given uh, castor oil. I think I, I'm of the generation that missed out on this, thank goodness. Uh, but uh, some people remember castor oil as a sort of gentle laxative. And the thing is that in this culture, in England um, and in Scotland, uh, when we say castor oil, we sort of think, um, you know, grandparents looking after us nicely, best of intentions, might have been a bit old fashioned, but, you know, uh, it, it's sort of quite a, a sort of funny, jokey feeling we have about it. But if I was giving this talk today in Italy, uh, there would be quite a different reaction. Uh, Italians have a very different relationship with the castor oil plant. And that's because um, during the uh, fascist era, um, the, uh, uh, the, sorry, during the fascist era, um, uh, people were, uh, th this badge that someone was wearing then, w w the fascist wore, which do you choose, the oil uh, or the club? Uh, in other words, they were threatening people with oil. And of course, you know, a spoonful to your child is one thing, but, um, you know, if it's to someone enough, quantity, it's not only humiliating, but but also lethal, um, and people died that way. And even today, um, in Italian, the phrase to use castor oil, usare l'olio di vicino, um, means to coerce someone or bully them, um, and, it, and it's used as an idiom. So uh, two cultures with quite different views of the same plant. And here's mandrake, also representing Italy. Um, notice those uh, flowers again, the feisty solanums. Um, uh, mandrake is a real plant, of course, not, not a mythical one from Hogwarts, uh, used since ancient times as an anaesthetic, often uh, added to wine, and all sorts of occult associations. Um, the shape of the root looks a bit like a person, often with a bit of judicious whittling, shall we say. Um, and uh, it, the story went that the scream of the mandrake could be deadly, so it was best to tie a dog to the root and have the dog pull it out. Uh, so you didn't have to hear the scream. Um, I think this is probably a story put about um, uh, to uh, stop people stealing what was actually a very valuable medicinal plant um, that was in short supply. Uh, there are also a lot of um, uh, you know stories about witch witchcraft and um, uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, <laughs> uh, witchcraft and um, flying on broomsticks. And uh, let me just read you a little bit about uh, witchcraft and, and flying on broomsticks. Several 14th and 15th century accounts describe witches' selves made from mandrake and other psychoactive plants, pounded together with grease. Such ointments hasten the absorption of the hallucinogenic drugs in mandrake through the skin and especially through the body's mucous membranes. One substance, hyacine, is known often to impart a convincing sensation of flying, which plausibly explains why so many medieval woodcuts depict nude or partially clothed witches, airborne and straddling broomsticks, an idea that still has common currency. I, I wanted to read that because obviously I have to be a bit careful with the wording. So um, uh, the... Uh, um, it, going on now to, uh, to to sort of think about we we thought about defence we thought about how plants feed themselves um, how how do they reproduce and the quick and easy way is obviously through suckers or by cloning these aspens are identical twins but of course that makes them very vulnerable to disease anything that one one is vulnerable to they'll all be vulnerable to um, and uh, you know surely there is a a, a better way of doing this. Um, so uh, uh, another way is sexual reproduction, and that um, tends to happen via pollen, uh, which carries the male sex cells from one plant to another. 
And, uh, you know, so there's plenty of trees and grasses that do this, all the cereal crops, for example, are grasses. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, you know, this alder tree uh, is, is chucking out lots of pollen. Uh, but the problem with this is that um, pollen is very tiny and you're trying to hit a target, which is uh, quite a long way away, potentially. Uh, so you have to make an awful lot of it and throw it off to the wind and hope that it gets to where you want it to go. Surely there's a better way. And of course, the better way is to get a go-between, give them a bit of nectar in exchange as encouragement for getting covered in pollen and go directly to the next plant. And the natural world is just full of amazing plant-animal interactions when it comes to pollination and seed dispersal. Um, but this is more about this sort of relationship between uh, plants and, and people. So here's tomatoes, closely related to the potato, uh, another solanum, once again brought from Mexico by the Spanish. Um, and because it was a solanum, Gerard, in his Herbal of 1597, um, even though he knew that the Italians and Spanish were enjoying them, he was very suspicious and he said, um, they are of rank and stinking savour. And that set back uh, adoption in Britain by hundreds of years. And it was probably Jewish and other immigrants from the Mediterranean who caused them to catch on here eventually. Um, they have a lovely relationship with bees. Now, not just any old bee will do, but bumblebees, which raise their wing beats to a, a middle C or something like it, just right to vibrate the pollen out of the flower. Commercial growers have bumblebees on standby for this purpose, and it's called buzz pollination. I'm sure you all know that. But there's an amazing thing. Um, tomato ripening, that's the ripening of the fruits, can be delayed by several days by playing the harvested fruit loud sound. That's right, you play a, a high C uh, for about six hours and uh, it'll delay the uh, ripening of the fruit. Now this is a useful thing uh, because uh, you know you don't want all your, you want to be able to control when your fruit ripens. The first thing, of course, is like, how does this work? And it, it's been replicated. It, it's, um, the, the sound is affecting the, uh, uh, the sort of RNA expression in the, in the, um, uh, in, in the, in the flowers and in the, in the, in the fruit. Um, uh, but the second question, um, and, and I'm happy to give people afterwards the scientific references, but the second question is, how on earth did people discover this? I just imagine a whole lot of bored people suddenly, you know, playing sounds to uh, to plants to see what happens. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the tomato itself is just full of fantastic stories. It's one of the longest entries in the book, actually, for that for that reason. Um, it often pays a plant to have a faithful relationship with a particular pollinator. They depend on each other. The pollinator gets reliable food. The plant gets reliable pollination. And this is the peacock flower. Why it's called that when I thought peacocks were blue, uh, I don't know, but it's the peacock flower of Barbados. And the yellow against the orange coloring of this sort of fifth, uh, fifth petal here um, is, is, the, uh, is a sort of giveaway. It's the, um, uh, especially attracted to butterflies, but less so to hummingbirds that would otherwise compete. And the flower times its nectar to the, uh, to the butterflies uh, when they're feeding, not to the hummingbirds, and has made the nectar tube irritatingly long for the hummingbirds. Um, this plant is also, um, uh, interestingly, the seeds uh, have been used for family planning by local tribes people. It contains an, abor a, an abortive drug. And during the slavery era, um, enslaved women would take these uh, seeds in order to abort children who would otherwise be born into and, and die in slavery. Um, interestingly, uh, when Meghan Markle married Prince Harry, um, her veil had a, uh, an embroidery of every, of plants from every country in the Commonwealth. And the, uh, plant from, um, the Barbados was the peacock flower. And I couldn't help thinking there was a sort of resonance there with her own family history. Uh, sad, sad story there. So you've gone to all this uh, trouble of, uh, of, of uh, making a, um, a, a baby and you have to disperse it so it doesn't compete with the mother tree or the mother plant. Um, so you can send things onto the wind, you can uh, get um, forgetful 
squirrels to bury your seeds and then forgot where they were and they they germinate um that that's particularly clever because they're actually burying them <laughs> for you um uh the cannonball tree you might think there's just plummet but actually they um uh they, they wild peccaries sort of wild pigs uh, disperse their seeds um the the plants um uh, one, of, one of the loveliest seed stories uh, for me is the is the nutmeg um uh, you know the the fruit uh, is has to be nutritious and appealing to something that will eat and disperse the seeds and in this case it's the nutmeg pigeon that does that nutmeg reached in, in sorry reached india from its home in indonesia about two and a half thousand years ago uh reached europe in i think arab traders kept the source secret for centuries um is very expensive very desirable uh, not just because it enlivened boring food but it was also used as an amulet so leonardo da vinci in 1510 for his trip to padua included a list of reminders spectacles with case penknife sheets of paper scalpel acquire a skull nutmeg that was his to-do list and the wars and skirmishes for control over the nutmeg trade went on and on between the the uh, dutch the british and the french and in um I think it was uh, 1660 something, 1667, the British finally gave up their claim to the island of Rum, which is the main source, well, was the main source of nutmeg in what is now Indonesia. Um, they gave up the claim in exchange uh, for a hopeless little Dutch outpost in North America. And that little Dutch outpost was called Manhattan. So Manhattan, the, you know, Manhattan was swapped by the colonial powers for monopoly nutmeg rights. Um, and this, by the way, is mace, the red arrow that surrounds the seed is, um, uh, is mace uh, and very attractive to pigeons, which see red very well. Um, in the 18th century, nutmegs were rumoured to spice up physical desire and performance. And European gentlemen carried po pocket nutmeg graters, um, uh, which, of course, meant that, uh, you know, the price was sky high. And you can see the little compartment for the nutmeg itself. And, uh, uh, you know, it's something they carried around when they thought they needed a little bit of help. Uh, they grated a bit of nutmeg. Uh, let me, uh, I'm, I'm almost done, but just let me finish um, with a, a little, um, I, I, I say something, um, uh, read you a little bit about nutmeg. A little nutmeg is a warming delight, but a whole seed or two in one go is dangerously narcotic and widely reported to be hallucinogenic. One would need to be desperate for a high, though, since the side effects, vomiting, confusion, dizziness and heart arrhythmia, are discouraging. It has only ever been a psychoactive drug of last resort. The African-American activist Fat Malcolm X wrote in his autobiography about using nutmeg in jail in the 1940s, and it was later banned from all prison kitchens in the United States to avoid misuse. And generations of students have tried and generally failed to achieve a cheap and rewarding nutmeg high. The most common misuse of nutmeg these days, misuses of nutmeg these days, are to powder it far in advance of use or to heat it for too long. Both culinary crimes destroy its precious but fugitive flavour. Nutmeg should be grated respectfully at the end of cooking. That way, even boiled rice pudding can be a pleasure. Um, if you've ever wondered why fruit are laxative, um, it's all part of the dispersal, seed dispersal story. Um, uh, you know, you want something to come along and eat you uh, so that you'll poo out the seeds somewhere else, but you don't want those seeds inside the uh, rather unpleasant um, uh, environment of a, an animal's gut for too long. So uh, along with the fruit and the seeds comes a laxative uh, and when that laxative is deployed, uh, the seed comes out with a nice bit of fertilizer as well. Um, th this uh, plant is Hura crepitans, the sandbox tree of, uh, well, this was in Madagascar. It's actually native to, um, uh, to, to Costa Rica, I think, and that, that part of the world. And one of the reasons that it's spread all over the world so well is that it's got this amazing method of dispersing its seeds these sort of tangerine-like structures of the seed pods. And when they dry out, they, they dry out differentially um, and enormous stresses build up until on a hot summer's day, um, the seeds 
uh, which are about the size of a pound coin, um, they, they whiz out at about 200 kilometers an hour. Uh, and at a perfect angle uh, that they um, uh, you know, fly, if taking into account wind resistance, they fly the absolute maximum distance. It's amazing. Um, so they'll fly maybe sort of uh, you know, 50 meters or so. And they are, um, uh, this, this is a, uh, it sounds like a, a, a gun battle going off when these things, uh, when these go. I mean, they're, they're amazing. In the 19th century, a, an Austrian botanist put one of these seed pods in a glass bell jar. Uh, luckily, he went out to lunch uh, because when he came back from lunch, there were bits of the glass bell jar embedded in all the walls <laughs> uh, as a result of this thing going bang. So I started with Spanish moss and I'll finish with its close relative, uh, the pineapple. It was so rare and expensive in the 18th century uh, when people finally managed to, uh, to sort of get them to, to, uh, to grow here, um, that people used to rent them out as an accessory for people to take to parties. And it entered the language to stand for anything that's sort of really great. So a pineapple of a gentleman, that party was quite the pineapple. And I hope in a way that this, this has been a pineapple of an evening. Charles Lamb um, wrote, pineapple is too ravishing for mortal taste. Um, she woundeth and excoriateth the lips that approach her, like lovers kisseth, kisses she biteth. She is a pleasure bordering on pain from the fierceness and insanity of her relish. Lamb's opinion might actually say more about him than it does about pineapple. Um, but uh, it, it is a, a sort of story of love, I suppose. And if you think about it, you know, plants need water, they need carbon dioxide, they need a few other nutrients, they need defense. They need a way to reproduce and a bit of space and a bit of love. That's what they need. Plants need some love. And I'll perhaps just leave you with that, that thought. Uh, the Wildflower Society is uh, plant love embodied, I suppose, um, and uh, a, a sort of truly wonderful organization that I'm proud to be part of, even though I'm not an eminent botanist. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, um, then please do. That's my email address, eco at johndrory.com, 